Welcome to the RCAP USA Roundup, a podcast where we have real conversations affecting both cattle producers and beef consumers. We're your hosts, Jaden Moreland and Karina Jones. With that, let's get to today's episode. This episode is sponsored by Papillon Agricultural Company. Papillon develops and produces premium nutritional products for dairy consultants, feed suppliers, and dairy producers nationwide. Backed by research and commercial trials, their products utilize cutting-edge innovation and consistent, high-quality ingredients to maximize feed efficiency. Through educational events, on-farm assessments, and superior products, Papillon is committed to serving industry leaders and identifying opportunities for increased efficiency. Visit papillon-ag.com and give them a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you, Papillon, for being a 2022 convention sponsor and thank you for your support. RCAP has had so many people that have played a huge part in our success as an organization, one of those being Dr. Max Thornsbury, former RCAP president, veterinarian, and current parliamentarian and animal health committee chair. He joins the podcast with us today to talk animal health in the U.S., the cattle industry around the world, freedom, liberty, and (laughs) MCOOL. Today we have a very special guest with us, former RCAP USA president, Dr. Max Thornsberry. So Dr. Max, would you please start us off with a quick introduction of who you are, your family, your operation. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I started with RCAF when they began back in 1998, went to the first meeting. I missed one meeting um, where I hurt my hand, but I think I actually went to that meeting, didn't I? Partway through, no, I didn't. Anyway, I got masked up in a shoot between me and a cow on the gate and had my hand hurt and didn't come to one but I think that's the only one I've ever missed since we started I was made president after I was made vice president of the board then they made me president of the board and I was president of the board I think for six years Um, and that goes back somewhere in the early 2000s I think I started in 2005 maybe Um, our operation is a beef cow calf operation Our family lives in this area and has since the 1830s, and we all are stock farmers. We've got eight grandkids. My son is a physician, and my daughter is a professional counselor, Um, and they each have four children each. So when we get them all together, it's a house full. I bet. I bet. So as you said, former RCAF president, and you are the current parliamentarian of RCAF and also the Animal Health Committee chair. So talk to us about your history in the vet and cattle and ag industries, kind of just how you got started and your professional career. Well, I got a degree in animal husbandry um, from the University of Missouri, got into vet school, got out of vet school in 77 and started practice here in Richland. And I've been here ever since. In the interim, I spent time in Haiti as with Christian Veterinary Mission. I think I've been to Haiti six times, five times, my wife says. We lived there for about six months. Uh, My son goes back there quite often, and my daughter as well. My son is a physician for a, um, what you call, it's not an orphanage anymore. It's it's a um, kind of an enterprise system where they try to teach uh, Haitian people how to make a living, and then they also educate their children. So he's their head physician, uh, communicates there with their registered nurses by Zoom. And my career has been in livestock. Uh, I did a little bit of small animal and equine, but my practice is 100% bovine right now. A little bit of sheep, a little bit of goat, uh, rest of it all bovine. Very cool. So how did you, like, did you always kind of start with cattle or what, what made you get from, you know, vet school to bovine, I guess? Well, when we started here in 77, there was quite a variety of livestock enterprises here. There was some poultry, some free range turkey that I worked with a little bit. There were a lot of swine producers, a few sheep producers. The goats had pretty much moved out by then. We all had Angora goats here for years. But about that time, the coyotes come in and people really didn't want to fight around with them. So the goats had pretty much gone. And the rest of it was bovine. By 1985, the full integration of the poultry industry and the full integration of the swine industry, I had no poultry clients, I had no swine clients, and so the only other alternative was to move 100% bovine. Just in the recent years alone, like you were talking about, our industry has changed really drastically. So kind of talk to us more on 
kind of the change of the livestock industry landscape throughout your career and really just like since your ancestors in the 1800s settled in, kind of how has it changed, you think, since then? Well, the primary change in this area has been the loss of the swine industry. Uh, while we've always had cattle, always had beef cattle, used to be 29 dairies here in about a 30 mile radius of where I live, there are three left. Um, we've lost all of our swine business as a veterinarian. You could put all the swine veterinarians in the United States, as Johnny Smith used to say, in one school bus, and you could put about all the poultry veterinarians in one school bus. Almost everything in those two industries is now performed by technicians. So the demand for veterinary services in uh, food animal is quite small. I read an article yesterday in Veterinary Practice News that only 8% of all the veterinarians in the United States, 8% actually function as food animal veterinarians. That would include your feedlot veterinarians, what few swine veterinarians work for like Cargill and ConAgra and, and Smithfield and what few uh, poultry veterinarians work for Tyson. It's a phenomenally changing dynamic. I think I've been out 44 years now, if I've got my numbers right. And in that time, the complete integration of the poultry industry took place and the complete integration of the swine industry took place with no demand for veterinary services. So I launched out into feedlot medicine. I owned my own feedlot for 18 years, a little preconditioning lot, about 500 head turned it every 60 days, so quite a few head for a year, but for our country about standard size, and began to do a lot of uh, bovine reproductive work, um, artificial insemination, um, semen testing for bulls, pregnancy testing cows, and general herd health work. The last few years, I have been working as a consulting veterinarian for a company in Minnesota that makes um, calf and lamb and uh, foal milk replacer. Gotcha, very interesting. Yeah, I know that fact about only 8% of vets are food production veterinarians is very interesting because I know in our area of West Texas, there's like one vet. I mean, there's more than one vet, but like in our surrounding counties, there's one. And I feel like that used to just be, I mean, each town used to have a vet. And there's, you know, I think that says something about the cattle industry and our rural economies of there's no motivation for people to come back to those towns necessarily. And so I found that fact really interesting, the 8%. It you is, get... and that's a very recent figure uh, from a very good source. I didn't realize that it had diminished that much. Um, and the primary reason for that is economics. If there's no hog work to do in the country, your bovine work is pretty seasonal. We're real busy in the spring, real busy in the fall. What do you do in the summer? What do you do in the winter? Um, it has become a changing economic dynamic in agriculture and a big part of that because of the integration of the livestock industry. About 80% of my practice was swine, 80 to 85 when I got out of veterinary school. And within seven or eight years, I had no swine clients. That's how fast this integration can occur. Dr. Max, I'd like you to expand on that just a little bit because that was um, an avenue we really weren't, you know, ready to explore, but I think you bring up a really good point of what the vertical integration does to rural communities. So are you saying that basically when an industry vertically integrates, um, what I see here in central Nebraska with vertically integrated, you know, cattle feedlots that have their own backgrounders, those kind of things, is they don't need the community vets to go to those backgrounding lots. Their system has their own vets. Their system has their own um, pharmaceutical supplies. So, so that all all those support industries become concentrated with the larger industry. Correct. That is correct. When everyone in our part of the country had a dozen sows, 24 sows raising feeder pigs, you go to town on Saturday and you could not to get through town. They were there to go to the hardware store. They were going to the clothing store. They were buying feeders and waters and nails and lumber and wire. And it was a huge amount of economic impact to the community. 
when the swine industry left, that totally left. Um, about the only pigs you're going to find in my part of the country are a few show pigs. So the economic impact, you don't sell tractors, you don't sell trailers, you don't sell feed, you don't sell hardware, you don't sell lumber. And it has had a dramatic impact on our rural towns. We are a, a typical rural country town, about 1,800 people. My wife sits on the Rural Development Corporation here. I've done everything they can to promote our town, put in uh, street lights. But the economy can't just depend on retired people going to town and buying groceries. It has to be a vibrant economy. And when we lose the livestock production in our area, we lose that vibrant economy. I recently heard your presentation that you gave to the Independent Cattlemen of Missouri. It was excellent. It made me, you know, it just made me think a lot. You said something really profound. They don't need to own the land. They already own the market. Can you expand on that, please? Yes, I'd be glad to. In the swine and poultry industry, it is fully integrated, meaning they own everything. They own the animals, they own everything. The only thing they don't own is the farmer may own the building. The company may actually even own the building. The farmer may put up the building, but he doesn't own the stock that goes in that building. He doesn't buy the feed locally. He doesn't buy any veterinary supplies. He doesn't need a local veterinarian, like you mentioned with integrated corporate feed yards. Most of all that work now is done by veterinary technicians and you will have a veterinarian at a home office somewhere and he'll send them out a list of things he wants done and the technicians go and do it. A completely, well, a complete turnaround from when I got out of veterinary school. I studied the anatomy and dissected nine species. I was prepared to go out there and be a general practitioner and address all species. Well, I don't, touch, I, I did a little bit of work for a quail raiser the other day, and I have an autopsy to pig in 20 years. It is just uh, phenomenal. Now, in the cattle industry, they're not going to do that. They're not going to buy the cows. They're not going to buy the land. But how they are going to integrate this system is just like you said, they're going to integrate, integrate it to the market. They're going to direct buy the cattle. Uh, or they're going to send buyers to your local feed yard, but there might be two or three feed, two or three industry people run by a company. Company owns them, and they're buying cattle for two sets of different kinds of feedlots around the country. It really has had a huge impact when we lost country of origin labeling, because now the packers can buy your cattle, take them to town, take them to slaughter, feed them, take them to slaughter and your product cannot be differentiated in the market. They'll bring meat in from Brazil to utilize the excess pelvic heart and kidney fat that's in a nice fat steer. Um, you get no impact whatsoever from having the best animal control, having the best animal welfare, having the best pharmaceutical industry, having the best safety record in the world, uh, you can you can verify that by going to the FDA. There was not, an, in my knowledge, there was not one case of a residue in a beef animal in the United States last year. There were a few dairy cows that were sent to town before their mastitis tubes had finished cleaning out, but it was very, very, very low. Just just a very few, no beef whatsoever. So you couldn't ask for a better food safety record than we have in the United States, but yet. My steers, when they're fattened out, go in a package, just like Brazil's or Paraguay's or Uruguay's or Argentina's, all that meat just gets pooled together once it's taken out of the package and just, it all says USDA inspected. And nobody has the slightest idea where it came from. You are one of our industry experts within RCAF that we lean on to give us that view of globally what is going on in the cattle industry because you and your wife Brenda have traveled the globe more extensively than anybody else in our calf. So talk to us about in your travels, what have you seen in terms of um, cattle industry trends, health in other countries, and even what you see in the grocery store or at restaurants when you are traveling globally? Uh, don't get me started. Uh... <laughs> I can tell you this, that we're about the only place, Canada, Mexico, and the United States, North America is about the only place left that's not foot and mouth infected. And we don't 
<clears throat> think much about that because the USDA is letting Brazil and Uruguay and Paraguay and parts of Argentina export meat into our country because they say they live in a region of that country where they don't have foot and mouth. We had that happen with a uh, country in, in uh, Paso Fina, I think, from Africa that had the right to export meat. Suddenly they had foot and mouth and it was all shut off and then they, okay, no problem. It's hard to comprehend what the level of our animal health and food safety and animal welfare is versus the rest of the world. I found it to be very adequate in Japan. I found it to be really adequate in South Korea. I found it to be adequate in um, Europe. But everywhere else I've been, people would be appalled at the differences. Now, I don't mean to be running down our uh, fellow cattle producers in Uruguay and Paraguay. There are some really good producers down there. But they were using medications that had never been allowed in the United States. Um, they were injecting animals with um, testosterone, which we used to do here, maybe to soup up a uh, gomer bull, something in that respect. We can't do that without prescriptions now. There are just lots of things. DDT is still used in some countries. When I was there in 2005, I watched them spray DDT and molasses onto a big piece of burlap to try to attack, attract flies to that to kill them. They weren't spraying it on the animal, but they were still utilized. Things of that nature, there are extremely good quality cattle in South and Central America. I'm talking about genetics that are through the roof. And one thing that is happening is our semen companies are sending them our best Angus and Hereford and Shorthorn semen for $3 a straw, while we've got to pay $12, $15, $25 a straw for it. They're starting in certain places to get these F1 crosses that are half Angus, half Hereford, half Shorthorn, and half Bramer. And they're going to start competing for quality a lot quicker than I think our industry is really prepared for. You know, I don't care about that. They can raise the best cattle. I saw the finest genetic red Bramers, white Bramers, gray Bramers, I guess I've ever seen in the world. I don't care, I'm glad they're doing that. Everybody I met in those countries had a PhD or a master's degree from one of our land grant universities, University of Iowa, University of Illinois, University of Missouri, or I mean not Iowa, but Iowa State. All of them had a degree. They were sent there free by their own government. I send my kid to college and it's gonna be a 50 to $100,000 bill. There are lots of things that are not equitable. The University of Missouri has a a coal relationship with university in Brazil. They get all our research, they get all of our management, they get all of our genetics. Um, they're gonna be formidable competitors if we cannot identify our product in the market. You know, as, we, as you touch on that, do you think these other countries, specifically like Brazil, Mexico, are watching the decline of the U.S. domestic cow inventory, licking their chops, saying, you know, the U.S. is our target market? It is. We've got, as Bill Bullard likes to say, we've got the most significant beef market in the world. There's 335 million people here, and that's the ones they can count. And no place else in the world do you have the demand. Now, I'm not saying our per capita intake, the Uruguayans and Argentinians eat a lot more beef per person per year, double the amount, but there's not as many people. Uruguay is not any bigger than the state of Iowa, and they have less people than the state of Iowa. So we think in terms of these countries, we have our mind's eye view, they're like ours. They're like ours, they're not like ours. They're much smaller, have much lower populations. They're raising a whole lot more meat um, than they can consume themselves. In most of the countries I went to, I dealt with pretty well wealthy livestock producers. People who kids went to the University of Missouri, went to Illinois, went to Iowa State, Purdue, the best universities we have in the United States for agriculture. They were all pretty wealthy people. They had a lot of land, they had a lot of cattle. In those same countries, there are people living in a cardboard shack. Um, thousands and thousands of them. I saw places in Honduras where people lived in a shack and didn't even have a door, had a sheet hung over their door. 
the poverty in these countries is astronomical. And instead of taking the product they're producing and feeding their own people, they're exporting it to us, even though it may not bring the same price that our beef would bring, it dilutes our market, it re increases our supply, and Bill has proven that we are very supply sensitive. Why don't they take care of their own people before they export their beef and their food to the United States? Because they need foreign exchange. Everyone there has a telephone, a, a mobile phone, but they need foreign exchange and the way they get foreign exchange, the way they build wealth is they send their product, which they should be retaining in their own country to feed their own people, to our country, participate in our market. So what do you and Brenda see when you travel abroad in terms of labeling of beef? That's quite interesting. Every place that I have gone, the meat is labeled whether it was Vancouver in Canada, whether it was Tokyo in Japan. In Japan, they are adamant about labeling their meat. They will even in the meat case have a little iPad there where you can touch it and the farmer and his wife and his kids will come on and they'll take them a tour of their farm. That's how adamant they are about their labeling. Even meat is labeled in Costa Rica. Meat is labeled in Honduras. Meat is labeled in restaurants in Honduras. I'll give you an example. I had eaten a lot of old tough Bramer meat. And when you eat tough Bramer meat, and I'm not against Bramer meat, but there's no marbling. And most of these cattle have several years on them when they're slaughtered. So it's not like going and having a piece of choice or a prime steak at a Ruth Chris. Not much conversation in the meal because you're spending your time chewing so I chewed that old meat for two weeks and I, there was a, uh, a typical restaurant there. I think it was an Applebee's. And so I said, well, I looked it all up on the internet and it said, carne importe, which means imported meat. I said, there we go, we'll go there. We go there, we order ribeye, we saw into it. And it was just as tough. I, I called the waiter over, I said, your ad said this was carne importe. Yeah, he says, it's from Australia. So even the meat in the restaurants is labeled. It's all of these countries have labeling um, and some of them adamant about it. I don't know that we're not the only place left in the world that doesn't get to label our meat. Our lamb is labeled. I think our goat is labeled. Our fruit is labeled. This shirt's got a label on it. This iPhone has even got a deal in it when you hit it and will tell you exactly where it was made. It, it is the most unfair thing we have ever encountered in the market that we cannot identify our own product in our own country. That's crazy to me that these like third world countries have labeling on their products and yet our country claims it costs too much. Like, I don't understand that <laughs> correlation. That's, I didn't know that they had them even labeled in the restaurants. That's crazy. It's not about the cost of labeling. You think in this modern computer age of iPhones and iPads and everything, even the lines those cattle go on have got um, eyes in there, little infrared eyes, count them, look at their numbers, check their rib eyes, everything else. You think in this age that it'd be too hard to keep track of the meat to label? It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact you can take Brazilian meat and pay half the, half the much for it Mix it in with our hamburger and charge the same price. That's what it's all about. So in terms of declining market share, vertical integration, return of the consumer dollar or re more return of the consumer dollar back to the cattle producer, do you believe that mandatory country of origin labeling is the answer to all of those problems? Is it the complete answer? Probably not. Uh, but I think it's a major answer, and I think we have a time in history we can look back to and prove that's, that's, a, that's exactly the impact. When we shut off um, importing cattle and meat from Canada because of BSE back in 2003 and 4, first time we ever saw cattle go to a dollar a pound, Bill called me up in the middle of the spring and said, come to Minneapolis, I need you to be there tomorrow. And I said, oh my goodness. And uh, this was after 9-11 and you bought a ticket and one day, man, they strip searched me. I mean, they thought I was a terrorist. And so I got there and we had a meeting with the Department of Agriculture 
and the Secretary of Agriculture and the president of the NCBA all sitting at the table. Big meeting, held it on campus at St. Paul. And the Secretary of Agriculture is the same one we got now, got up in front of that crowd of producers and said, beef is too expensive and the price needs to come down. And the president of the NCBA sitting there nodding his head, yep, that's right, it's too high. It's too high, it was a dollar a pound. We were getting a dollar five, a dollar six for fat steers. Um, this is an industry that is broken. It is literally broken. We have the best meat. We have the best quality meat. We have the safest meat. We have the best record. No beef cattle with any residue in them last year with the FDA. None. None. Unbelievable record. And yet you're bringing product in from countries where an inspector goes down there maybe once a month and looks things over. Um, it's unfair. And it's all because we have decided to be part of the WTO. I listened to Bill's podcast from yesterday and he explains it in significant detail. Not, he tells you all the specifics. He's the numbers person. As Brenda wrote a poem, there was a new sheriff in town when Bill Bullard come on board because he had facts and figures and graphs to back up everything. And I'm not that kind of person, I don't retain all that, but I can tell you that we are importing meat from countries that people would not even recognize the name of. Nondescript little podunk countries out there in the middle of nowhere and they have as much say so as the World Trade, at the World Trade Organization as we do a country of 335 million people. It is an unfair circumstance as Bill explained in his video, the WTO has lost some of its significance, but we're still bound by what our Congress did back about 2011, 2012, 2014, when they repealed country of origin labeling. The WTO said they were gonna fine us $30 million if we didn't get rid of mandatory country of origin labeling. That'd have been a dollar a cow to get $2 a pound or better for our livestock. I'd have paid that dollar and a New York minute, and so would have anyone else. But instead of addressing it, pulling out of the WTO and saying, what right do you have to tell us what to do in our own country? They came and they overwhelmingly voted to get rid and appeal mandatory mm -hmm. of country origin labor. They just appealed it on beef and pork. Mm -hmm. Repeal, what I say, appeal? I don't mean appeal, I mean repeal. I'd like to appeal it, I can tell you that. <laughs> but we still have it on lamb. We still have it on fruit. We still have it on clothes. Why just pork? Why just beef? Because that's where the money is. So when it comes to these imports of beef and live cattle, do you think that there is also a greater um, threat looming in terms of biosecurity to our domestic cow herd? You know, every time foot and mouth disease has entered another country, it's entered on pork. The last time it came here, it came on an Argentinian cruise ship in 1929. They killed 40,000 head of livestock before they got it contained. I'm not terribly concerned about it from the beef standpoint, but from the swine standpoint, it always enters country with raw pork. It entered Japan, it entered South Korea, it entered Great Britain. Uh, yeah, it's a potential risk, but it's going to be devastating because of how the government is going to respond to it. Foot and mouth is a devastating disease for swine. It's uh, an aggravating condition for cattle. And if we do get it, and we get it in several locations, I think you'll find the USDA is just, USDA is just going to go to vaccinating for it. And we're just going to be another foot and mouth infected country. I'm not overly concerned about it considering, uh, but we used to only bring meat in from countries that had foot and mouth that had been partially cooked to kill the virus. Now we bring raw meat in. So does the potential exist? Absolutely. Do you think that um, placing the, the foot and mouth disease vaccine bank in the heart of cattle country poses a serious concern? Well, they're putting vaccine banks all over the country. They're putting one in Denver. Uh, they're wanting to start making vaccine at Texas A&M, right outside of Texas A&M. I think that the USDA has finally come to the conclusion that 
their real only hope of containing foot and mouth in this country. And I don't think, I think they really get right down to it. I think they want us to be just like everybody else. You understand me? And you might think that's a conspiracy theory, but I think they've made that decision. I attend all these meetings. If it's one little spot where it shows up, they're going to do what they normally do, kill everything, no cattle raised there for a certain period of time, so on and so forth, and isolate it. But if it crops up 10 places around the country, we're just going to start vaccinating like the rest of the world. They've already made that decision. We know that the USDA is leaning more towards um, or, or getting ready to kind of launch back into mandatory RFID issuance. Do you think mandatory RFID is the silver bullet against fighting a foot and mouth disease outbreak, especially when we have so many live cattle coming in from the South that there's no way to even prove what country those cattle really came from, from the South? That's a good point you're making. When I was in Central America for our calf in 2005, I was in Nicaragua. And in Nicaragua, they are putting feeder steers on ships, ship them along the Pacific coast and taking them to Mexico and feeding them out. I saw an animal there that had been brought from Argentina into uh, Costa Rica. And I said, do you not know there is a barrier in Panama that's 100 miles wide to prevent any livestock from South America entering North America live? Oh, well, we just put them on a boat and brought it up here. Uh, yeah, that happens. Um, all those cattle are vaccinated for foot and mouth. Foot and mouth's number one vaccine for cattle in the United States or in the world. It's the number one manufactured vaccine in the world. We're not allowed to use it in the United States. But once we get an outbreak, these vaccine banks are going to be available to use it. And you're, in specific, you're talking about the bio lab that's going to be put in, um, in the center of Kansas. It, um, right outside of Kansas State University and the vet school. Is, are there potential for leaks from these highly secure labs? Yeah, there are. It's happened, it happened in human labs, happened in the lab that we have on Plum Island a couple of times. Always on Plum Island, they've got, they have um, sentinel cattle around there. She knocked over my shotgun shells. They have sentinel animals in there that, um, you know, they know if it's got out. If an animal comes down foot and mouth, they know it's got out, but it's a way a mile off on a little small island. Uh, they since retrofitted Plum Island because they have been so slow in getting the uh, lab up in, in uh, Kansas. At this point in time, it's a moot point. They're going to put the lab there, and there's not a thing in the world you or I or anybody else is going to do about it. And um, that's that's the end of it. If it gets out, not a good place for it to get out in the number three cow calf state in the nation. RFID tags. We have good evidence and good historical evidence of how well this system works with the country of Australia. They have been doing this for a number of years. They have ghost cattle, they have cattle that can't identify. Uh, as far as RFID in every animal, right now we RFID the cattle that come through the sale barn that we're going to test for brucellosis or for TB or do other some other kind of regulatory work with. We are not required to RFID our feeder steers. Imagine running every one of your cattle through the chute when you bring it to the sale barn. Imagine how many broken legs. Imagine how many damaged cattle. Imagine how many bruised cattle. Imagine how much more stress on the animal it's going to be. Imagine how much greater pneumonia and respiratory diseases. It is an unworkable system. It doesn't work in Australia. And yet they have, uh, it's just like it's a, it, it's like an idol that the USDA worships. We have very good tracing capabilities through our livestock auctions. Uh, I don't think it's going to do anything that cause a huge disaster. It'll be a complete failure in some regards. You'll never be able to find all the cattle. The tags fall out. Cattle are going to get hurt. Every animal is going to have to go through the chute. The readers don't work half the time. The numbers get mixed up in the computer. And I could go on and on. It'll be like all these other government programs. They start that are disaster. They just keep going with them. And I see that they're going to make every effort to force this on our industry, unless we have some legislative action to prevent it. 
do you have concerns about who will have access to that data, to our data? I mean, if we are mandated to tag oh, all that data is safe. <laughs> it's all safe. None of that ever gets lost, does it? None ever, you never read anything about every credit card number from Sears getting exposed to the world, do you? Just the other day, a whole bunch of USDA data was, was released to the public. Yeah, I'm worried about it. Not only worried about it, I wonder who's going to be able to access it and know exactly what the inventory is. How many 500-pound feeder steers are going to come in October and then in November and then in December? And once you gain that information, you basically have control of the market. I'm sure there's no Russian hackers that would have an interest in our food no. supply. <laughs> no. and they hack them all the time. USDA yep. hacked just the other day. <laughs> Yep, it is, um, it is something. So if we don't see some pretty immediate reforms within this cattle industry to address this cattle industry crisis, what do you see being the future of the cattle industry and more importantly, rural America? Well, if it becomes fully integrated and we're simply gonna raise calves for uh, the four packers, that's, you know, that's essentially where they want it to go. They want to fully integrate the market. They don't want to own the cows, but they only want you to be able to sell them to them. They may do it through animal welfare requirements. They've already done that in trucking. They may do it through sustainability requirements. Um, they may do it through genetics. They're doing it in the swine industry. You know, you can only breed to certain genetics. That's already starting in the United States with people that have contracted their calves. You have to be half this or three quarter that, or you must use this kind of bull, uh, this genetics, these F1 crosses have got to be this. You're going to lose full capability of making your own management decisions. You won't need an ag degree. All you're going to need to do is just ask them what they want you to do. And it's already started. The question is, what can we do to stop it? What can we do to gain control of our own livelihood? And I believe that to be mandatory country of origin labeling. If the packing industry can not mix your beef in with beef from Uruguay and Paraguay and Argentina and Brazil and Timbuktu, Africa, you got a chance. If they can, just a matter of time. Yeah, and I think that segues us into our next question of, for those listeners who have not had a chance to look at all of our our calf videos on YouTube from our recent convention and who didn't get to come to convention, Dr. Max, you always give a prayer breakfast. And this year you gave one on liberty and it was super powerful. And so tell us what freedom and liberty means in this country and why it is so important to our cattle industry. Liberty is defined as the ability to make your own decisions for your own life without interference. That's what liberty is. We've lost liberty in this country. Well, in all, practically every area of life, including education, including the medical field. And what they're going to do, if they, if they mandatorily, um, if they make RFID tags mandatory for every livestock, individual head of livestock, then your liberty is gone. If they make you... Um, inseminate and use a certain line of genetics before they'll buy your feeder cattle, your liberty is gone. If you have no access to the market because there is no market, your liberty is gone. A lot of us talk about swine producers that are raising swine for a company as really a modern form of sharecropping. That was a disaster in the South when they started it after the Civil War. Uh, it's a disaster today no matter what it is, where you have no control of your own life and your own freedom. Yep, that was perfectly put. Um, so I guess, is there anything else you'd like to add before we do any final comments or questions? Well, the question is, what do we do to help ourselves? If you set back like the producers that raised hogs did in the 70s and 80s and just let the system suck you up, you're not being an activist. You're being a pacifist. You're just waiting for it to happen. And in order not to be a pacifist about this, 
you've got to be active. And it's not just calling uh, representatives and senators, but it's, that is a part of it. Part of it is understanding that consumers are on our side. I heard a gentleman give a speech the other day that said the consumers are our greatest enemy because they're going to ask us to do this, this. No, they're not. They are our greatest asset. They are our greatest ally. They're looking for safe, quality meat. It's these um, integrators that are going to force you into doing things that you don't want to do, like breed to certain genetics, have a certain kind of F1 cross as a cow, only market livestock to them, only administer these medications or these vaccines. You're going to lose all control of your own management, and you're going to basically become a sharecropper for the Packers. So what do you do? You become an activist. You do what the industry is trying to do to make the changes to get mandatory country of origin labeling reinstated. Without it, it's a matter of time before they integrate this system where we lose all control. Right now, only about 8%, 10%, not even that, um, of cattle, fat cattle are marketed on an open bid system where they come to the feed yard and offer to give you this much for your cattle for your pen of cattle. And that's all we have running the market now. Eight or 10% of the cattle being sold fat are the market. Well, how are you gonna have a market when everything else is integrated into the system is forward contracted or is owned by the packer themselves? You have no idea of how many cattle are being sold. You don't know what their weight is. You don't know what their sex is. You don't know what their grade is. You have no idea because it's not put in the system. You don't know what your cattle are worth. And that's the beginning, that's the harbinger of what is happening in our industry today. So to close this out, Dr. Max, we always ask one question at the end of our podcast. What is your favorite cut of beef and how do you like it prepared? I love a bone-in ribeye, uh, choice or prime, but I eat mostly tenderloin. <laughs> and the reason why I do that is because they come in such smaller servings. I can buy a six or eight ounce tenderloin, and if I buy a bone-in ribeye, it's going to be 12 or 16 ounces. But I also have a Yeti, and I can stick it in there and bring it home, and we can have it for two or three other meals. But either one of those cuts are my favorite. Bone-in ribeye from a choice or prime animal and uh, beef tenderloin from about anything. <laughs> <laughs> Those are both super good options. And Even a cow tenderloin is good, I tell you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Max, for joining us today and for all the work you put into fighting for the U.S. cattle industry. We are so blessed to be able to raise cattle in the United States, and we will continue to fight for the freedoms and liberties of our industry so we can continue raising the most wholesome, healthiest, highest quality beef in the world. Mandatory country of origin labeling affects cattle producers, consumers, rural America, and really everyone. We need to label our beef and we need to do it soon. Visit labelourbeef.com to send a message to your congressman to support the American Beef Labeling Act, S2716 in the Senate and HR7291 in the House. It takes five minutes and can help make a huge difference in bringing back profitability to the American cattle industry. Stay in the know and stay involved in the conversation Follow us at RCAP USA on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the RCAP USA Roundup. To learn more about RCAP USA, visit our website, www.r-calfusa.com.